worked. Hey, everyone. It's JT. Happy Wednesday. And it's cold here. It's raining, but it feels like it should be snowing here in New England. Welcome, everyone, to our live stream event. So this is Office Hours, where I'm going to spend the next 30 minutes, 3-0, 3-0, depending on which way you're looking, answering your career questions. So if you have questions for me, you know what to do. Just put it in the chat box. Make sure you use the word QUESTION first in all caps so that I can pick it out of all the chatter. And then I will answer those questions for you. Okay, wonderful. So while I'm waiting for you to get in there and start to put on your, your questions, I'm obviously going to share this with everyone out there in the, uh, the universe. Hey, Todd. Um, and also remind you that this is sponsored. This is brought to you every week by our company, Work It Daily. People always go, oh, Work It Daily, it's that site that does all those videos on YouTube. Or, oh, Work It Daily, I read a bunch of their articles online. Yeah, that's definitely what we do. We give out a lot of free advice. But what we really do, what we really, really do is become your career coach. We help you get the results that you're looking for whether it's I'm trying to get a new job and it's not working for me, JT, or I'm trying to build up my brand and my reputation as a professional. I'm trying to change careers. Um, I'm convinced I'm being discriminated against for my age. I hear that one a lot. Uh, I'm trying to get a promotion. I'm dealing with a difficult coworker, a difficult boss. There's a lot of stuff in our life that we're trying to do related to career. And we have this silly, silly idea that we're supposed to figure it out ourselves. They didn't teach us in school. How many of you had a class on career development every year. None of you did. I guarantee you, none of you did. And yet somehow we all think we're supposed to know how to do this for ourselves. And how many of you think that we're all exactly alike and that the same techniques and information apply to all of us? Again, we know we're individuals. Our situation is unique. What you want in a career is different from what he wants in a career and she wants in a career. And so you need coaching. In the same way we go to a doctor and a dentist, a lawyer, an accountant, a personal trainer, any time in our lives where we want to improve something, we get a coach, we get a mentor, we get a, a teacher to help us synthesize the information and get going in the right direction. You know, one of the things that you'll learn if you join Work It Daily, you're able to download the book that I wrote on this subject. And there's a, something that I call the GLOW method that I invented years ago. And it's the way for you to lock on to what you're trying to achieve in your, in your life with your career. And the GLOW method stands for gain perspective. Because again, if you had the right perspective, you'd be solving your problems right now. So you've got a perspective issue. Luminate the goal. Get super clear in what we're going after. No moving targets here. Have a goal. It's actually the reason why most people don't improve their careers is they actually don't have a goal. They know what they don't want, but they don't know what they do want, right? So gain perspective. Luminate the goal. Own your actions. That's right. Be accountable for what you're going to do in order to get those results and work it daily. Glow, G-L-O-W. And that is where we got the name Work It Daily. So in case any of you ever wondered, that's how that all came into being. Because of those four steps, gain perspective, illuminate the goal, own your actions, work it daily. It's the work it daily part that gets you results. I read this awesome quote last week. I was at a conference by, and they said, Einstein said, I'm not the smartest person. He said, I just stick with the problem longer. And I think that's another way of talking about working it daily. Maybe you've got a career problem right now that you're trying to solve. It's coming here and attending office hours, step in the right direction. But what are you doing to work it daily? Who are you partnering with every single day to make sure that you're moving in the right direction and getting those results, having that Einstein moment? I challenge you on that. And if you think you're ready for that, and I'm sure that you are, then you should come and work with us at Work It Daily because we are the first online virtual amazing career coaching program that is super affordable. Just like a gym membership, you now have complete access to career coaching tools and resources that are going to help you stay accountable, help you gain perspective, illuminate the goal, own your actions and work it daily for a very inexpensive price. So that's my pitch to all of you. If you like what you hear today, if you stick around and you hear me answer questions and you go, that makes sense to you. I wish I could do this all the time. I wish I could move my career forward. That is what we do every single day. And that's what you could be doing for yourself. Okay. All righty then. Let's get down to the business of answering some questions in this office hour, should we? So um, let's see. I hope I say this correctly. Shout out to Pratek. Pratek Mazna. Hey, Pratek, I hope I'm saying that right. I'm sorry if I'm not getting your name right. Um, the question is, any CV tips for graduates with no experience? Yeah, of course. So 
First of all, your resume is not going to be more than one page long. Let me give you that tip right there. If you have no experience and you're a student, don't try to make stuff up. Don't try to fill pages and make yourself look more important than you are. All you need to do is stick to the facts. In this case, at the top of it, you're going to talk about your key skill sets that you've obtained through your education. You're going to tell us about your education, and then you're going to tell us about any additional experience, maybe volunteering, maybe you did some internships, that sort of thing. And it's going to be in that order because the recruiter is going to want to see front and center that you got your degree and what it's in. But also, what are the transferable skill sets that you've been able to develop while studying this? So that needs to be front and center. That's how you brand yourself as a new professional. And then down below, you can have any of that volunteer work or non-related experience. Maybe there were jobs that you took to pay the bills while you were going through school. That all can be listed there as well. But the most important thing for you to understand, your resume is not going to be more than one page when you have no experience. All right? You're going to keep it simple. You're going to keep it clean. You're going to get out there. You're going to network and connect with those organizations that are looking to hire entry-level individuals. Okay? All right. Good luck with that. Let's see. So B. Farber says, hey, JT, I'm concerned that I might be terminated for performance. The criteria to improve is very vague. If I go to a temp agency and ask to be put on assignment, what should I tell them about the why? I think it's always uh, important to be honest. In the employment situation, folks, like it or not, People are going to check up on you. They're going to want to do reference checks. Things are, are, aren't going to make sense. So if you're in this role and you're now going to a temp agency and saying, put me on anything that you can, I want to get out of this, they're going to ask why. And I think not to be honest that there's something going on, that there's a disconnect would be unfair. So what I would do, though, is say, well, I've been working at this organization for a while. Um, they were recently gave me a very, very vague performance improvement plan. It just doesn't seem achievable because it's not very concise. And that concerns me. And I feel like that they're probably trying to oust me. And so, of course, I need to stay employed and I want to do good work. But without the clarity, and I've asked for the clarity and they're not giving it to me, all I can do is try to continue. But I think at this point, maybe the writing is on the wall that I'm not a fit and that it would be better for me to find something else. Being transparent like that is key. Giving them the facts that it hasn't been uh, hasn't been clear cut that they haven't given you um, sufficiently detailed goals. It's okay to mention that stuff and say for those reasons, my gut's telling me it's time to find a new opportunity, and that's why I'm touching base with you now. All right, that's what I would do most definitely. And these things happen, folks. There are times where we think we're performing to the best of our ability and we're doing an okay job and it's not in alignment with what the organization's looking for. The key is to not get emotional about it. And I know that that is very easy for me to say and very hard for you to do, but you have to learn to take yourself out of the emotion. All right. And one of the things that I've learned recently and been starting to use a lot with the people that I'm working with is this idea of verbally saying, I will not let that in. So when that's creeping in and you're feeling like, oh, they're judging me and, oh, I, I feel bad about this, you have to say, I will not let that in. I'm going to look at this situation objectively. Here's what's happening. Here's how the events are unfolding. And here's what I'm going to do to ameliorate the situ situation. Who say that fast. To improve this situation. I'm going to be proactive. I'm going to look for other opportunities. I'm going to recognize that I'm definitely not going to be here long term. So I've got to find my next move. That's how you have to look at this. You want to try to be as objective as possible, not let the emotion in and say to yourself, I will not let that in. I will not let that emotion in. I'm not going to let that consume me. I'm going to focus, you know, for better, for worse, the universe is telling me that I need to pivot in a new direction. Um, I don't necessarily enjoy or like how the universe is informing me of that, but it is. And I'm, instead of fighting against it, I'm going to roll with it and I'm going to turn my head in a new direction, look for something new and move on. And that's what I would do, truly, truly, from the bottom of my heart, say, I will not let that in. I will not let that emotion, that fear, that that sadness, that disappointment, I'm not letting it in. It is what it is. This is a sign. I need to pivot. I'm going to pivot. I'm going to get excited about pivoting. I'm being given the green light to pivot. That's what I'm going to do. And I need you to really embrace and internalize that. And folks, that goes for every time you're thrown what we call the career curveball, because we all get them. How you choose to react to that career curveball is going to impact how quickly you can get to a place where you're satisfied again. So if we get the curveball and we literally stand there and let it beam off the top of our head or hit us in the gut, and we just sit there and we wallow in the pain and go, ow, that hurt. That really hurt. I can't stop thinking about how much that hurt. We're not getting out of the way. We're not getting back up to bat. We're not in a position to swing for that home run. 
And so you absolutely have to think about how you're going to do this and say to yourself, I will not let that in. I will not let that in right now. I'm going to pivot. This is a sign and I'm going to use this sign to my advantage. Okay. I hope that helps. Great question. All right. Let's see. Shout out to everybody. You've got a lot of people on here today. Let's see. You got a question from, let's see. I'm trying to go in order, but I can't always folks. I'm just going to warn you now. Jeanette. Hey, Jeanette Marie, how to navigate a recruiter missing the schedule call due to the mistake of time difference. Their mistake of time difference. Oh gosh, that happens a lot, Jeanette. So if a recruiter misses the call because of the time difference, remember, um, you don't want to make them feel bad. They're super busy individuals. This kind of stuff happens. I think all you have to do is email them and say, hey, totally understand about the time difference change. I should have double checked with you. Take some accountability. Just say, I should have double checked with you to make sure you knew about the time zone difference. Uh, can we get, you know, can we reschedule this? I really do want to reschedule this. So just try to take some of that accountability to let them save face and see what happens and then leave it in their court. Now, what I wouldn't do is keep bothering them. Once you've done that, you've sent that account accountability and um, you've tried to let them save face, let it sit. If you don't hear back from them, that's generally a message telling you that they probably, and I hate to say this, didn't make the call because they found other candidates and they're not really into you. And again, this is a whole conversation that really sets people off. But folks, um, if you've ever seen stuff about, hey, he, he or she's not really that into you, that stuff happens in recruiting. They come at you, they say, we think you're perfect for the job. We want to have a conversation with you. You get all excited. You set the appointment and now they don't show. This happens a lot. And, you know, I'm, I'm not condoning it. I'm not, um, I'm not supporting it. I'm not saying that it's good or bad. It just is. It is part of the process. You want a job worth thousands of dollars. There will be rejection. There will be curveballs. There will be disappointment. Once again, going back to the earlier conversation, how you choose to react to that, all on you. It's a choice. So send them a nice note, let them save face, and leave it alone after that. That is all you can do. Trying to get into hot pursuit of them, not worth it. Not worth your time. You focus your energy the other way. Okay? All right. Great question. Jason. Jason says, outside of emailing and letter writing, what other proactive methods can I use to apply for a job? I get little response on LinkedIn. Thank you. So first of all, I wouldn't advise you to apply to jobs on LinkedIn without some sort of connection. So if you see a company has a job posting on LinkedIn, Jason, what you want to do is try to connect with several people who work there. So send them a customized connection request saying, we haven't met but your profile came up when I was researching the company. Can we, can we connect? Just simple like that. Your profile came up when I was researching the company. Can we connect? When they accept the connection request, you can say to them, I was curious if you can share your thoughts or insights on what it takes to get hired at the organization. Do you have one tip that you could share with me? The reason I ask is that you recently posted a job for an XYZ I believe that I'm a, a match, 100% match for the role. I'm sure there's lots of competition, though. So I look at your success at the organization. I wonder, what's one tip you would give me to stand out in this hiring process? What you're doing is focusing them in and only asking for one tip. Asking, hey, can you advise me? Is too general. Just say, what's your one biggest tip? You can give someone like me because here's the opportunity I saw, and I believe I'm 100% match, but I know there's a lot of competition. So what would you advise? One tip. That's easy for them to respond to. And they're also going to appreciate that you kept it simple. Um, and then what you can do when they give you that advice is say, thank you so much. I'm on top of it. I'm going to apply on LinkedIn right now. Um, if you if you think that it makes sense, can I reach out to the hiring manager? Would you happen to know the hiring manager? Would you feel comfortable giving me that person's name? I know it's totally my responsibility to reach out to them, but you know, it would be great if I could send them the cover letter that tells them why I'm so passionate about the position. So then you could ask for your next little nugget from this person and see if they'd be willing to help you. You can't ask that in the connection request and you can't ask that in your first outreach to them. That's too big of an ask. The only thing you can ask for when somebody agrees to connect from an employer is what's your tip? How'd you get hired? What's the one thing you'd advise me to do? If they respond, then you know they're receptive. Then you could ask for that extra step, which is, would you be willing to introduce me to the hiring manager? Again, I know it's my job to get hired, but I really want to share with them the story about why I feel so connected to the organization, right? That is how we teach you to do it inside the Work It Daily program. There's more to it than that, but hey, you got to join the program if you want to get all the good stuff, all right? That's how that works. So I hope that helps. Good luck. 
All right. Anne says, should you move your branding statement down on the LinkedIn page so it appears after the job description, the description of your job? Uh, for example, when you have a new job, do you cover that in the LinkedIn summary first or then the brand? Uh, so Anne, I, 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 we don't advise either, to be honest with you. So the summary by definition is short. It's very short. It should be factual. In two or three sentences, it should quantify your accomplishments. That's what it should be. And then it should be a list of your top key skill sets, the skills that you leverage currently in your work. It is that simple. A lot of people think they're supposed to put this long branding statement in. I've even seen people, oh, do it in the third person. It's a real turnoff to recruiters. That's not where that goes. It's not where it goes. Your branding statement is something that comes out of you when you're networking, when you're conversing with people, when you're asked about yourself. Your LinkedIn profile is supposed to be a nice, clean version of your online resume, right? It, it really is replacing your traditional resume. Recruiters spend six seconds on there. They don't want to read about your brand. They want to read about how many years of experience you have, how large were the projects that you've worked on, how many people have you managed. They want some quantifiable sense of your skills, and they want a list of those top key skill sets that you have. They want a lot of white space. They want to read that summary fast. They want to get to the good stuff. They will not read a long personal branding statement. So my answer is neither. I wouldn't do either of those things. It really is just about simplification. And it's something, again, that we teach inside of our program. You know, people make this mistake all this time. They don't understand that the goal is to optimize your LinkedIn profile to be found. LinkedIn is a search engine. It's a search engine for professionals. The more optimized your profile is to be found, the more recruiter searches you show up in. And I see this all the time. People inside the Work at Daily program go through our LinkedIn tutorial and then they show us because you can all look at your activity in LinkedIn, right? How many people viewed your profile? And you'll just see, they, they put the graph up inside our private Slack community and you see this and all of a sudden you see, whoop. And that's the day that they updated their profile using our, our tools. So again, it's, it's not as much of a branding tool as people think. Branding, by the way, is something that you do on an ongoing basis through the content that you promote on your social media platforms. Branding is, an, is something that you do, say, on Instagram or on LinkedIn, where you're sharing content, you're sharing videos, you're sharing articles, and you're sharing your perspective on these things, why you believe they're important, they're good, they're bad, they're valuable, they're relevant to your industry, to your skill set. This is how you position yourself as a subject matter expert. That is branding. So when I hear people say, I just have a brand new statement and Annie, and I know that's not your case, but you, you're giving me a chance to talk about this. It's not enough. Branding is this thing that happens um, through conversation. Branding is this thing that happens on a daily basis where you are pushing out content as a way to define your brand. So very, very different thing there. LinkedIn, LinkedIn's a resume. That's all it is. And it should act as such and it should be designed as such in order for you to be found. Yeah. So I hope that helps. Great question. Let's see. Again, folks, if I can't see question in all caps, I can't. There's too much chatter and I can't read it all. So I'm going to have to jump over you. Um, Pratik says, I get interviews, but no one accepts me for the positions. OK, so folks, if you're making it to the interview stage, it means <clears throat> you're doing something right. So you're finding the right opportunities where your resume, your LinkedIn profile are a match. And obviously you're doing okay over the, the phone screen. So if they're doing a phone call, that's good. Something's happening in your in-person interview. And all I can tell you is that people hire people. So when people hire people, right? A hiring manager is a person, a recruiter is a person, and they hire people. They hire them based on three things and in this order. Personality. Can I see working with you on a daily basis is your personality is the way that you communicate and interact. Do I feel comfortable with it? Would I feel comfortable with it day in and day out? Cause I'm going to spend eight to 10 hours a day with you. <clears throat> Aptitude. Do I think you can do it the way we need it done? Not the way you used to do it at your old employer, but the way we need it done. Do I get a sense as I'm talking to you that you would be flexible, that you could learn to do it our way, that you could adapt, right? So do you have the aptitude to do that? And then third, do you have the actual experience? So what I can tell you logically is that if you're not being selected in an interview, it doesn't mean that you're bad. It doesn't mean that you did anything wrong. What I'm telling you simply is the candidate that was selected was a better match based on one of those three things, maybe all three of them. They decided that the person they chose had a personality or an interaction style that was a better fit. 
or they had the aptitude, the ability to adapt on the job that they thought was stronger, or they had more experience. It could be one of those. It could be a combination. It could be all of those. They did not say you're a bad person. They did not say you're a failure. They just said with all these great candidates, here's the one that had the highest marks in terms of personality, aptitude, and experience for us, for that role, for today. I say that because I see so many people get angry and write a company off after they've been through their interview process. They don't get picked or they get told that they're second place. And their reaction is, well, pff, I don't, I don't want to work for them anyways. Yes, you do. Up until the moment you were told you didn't get the job, you wanted to work for them probably pretty badly or you wouldn't be so hurt. So why throw that relationship away? Who's to say that they aren't going to need to hire somebody in another week or a month or a few months? Who's to say this person that they chose doesn't work out? You never, ever know. And so that's a relationship that you should continue to nurture. So what I would say to you is all these companies that have brought you in for interviews and you didn't get the job, stay connected to them. Circle back with them. Ask them what you can do to be proactive and stay on their radar screen for future opportunities. Build a relationship with them. So when the time comes that they do need to hire, they're literally fast tracking you because they already know you. This is relationship building that you need to do. It's conversational job search, right? Conversational job search is how we connect with them through conversations. And this is the best way to job search. It's also called networking. But every time I use the word networking, people cringe. <gasps> networking. Ew, I hate networking. Do you hate having conversations? No. Do you like having one-on-one -on -one conversations with people where you get to talk shop? I do. I geek out on that stuff. Do you? Well, guess what? The last time you had a really interesting conversation with somebody about your industry or your skill set or a project, that was networking. That was networking. That is what networking is about. It's conversational job search, <laughs> you know, and you just need to do more of that and continue to do that even when employers don't choose you because that's how you can get hired later on. Okay. All right. So Coral has a question. Coral Flores. Hey, Coral. Coral says, how does one calm down their nerves before their interview? Oh, I got a good one for you on this. Um, I recently coached my own daughter on this um, and it really does work. And I wish I could take credit for it. I can't. And um, I'll tell you, I was on YouTube getting, I was sucked into the YouTube black hole. I absolutely love listening to self-help stuff on YouTube. I love it. All these amazing speakers and presenters are out there sharing their best nuggets of wisdom. And there was a woman out there that was sharing this concept that she came up with to motivate herself to do something. And it was amazing. She said it was the silliest thing. She said she envisioned herself as a rocket. She wanted to propel herself forward like a rocket to do things she didn't want to do. And she realized that the way to do it was to count down from five. So five, four, three, two, one, go. Okay. So she shared this and I thought, and that's interesting. She goes, there's a science to it because when we count up, counting up never ends. Think about that. You can count up forever and ever. But when you count down, we all think about that. Our brain, because we're counting down to zero, literally focuses in. <clears throat> so that's my first thing I want you to do. When you've got nerves, you're going to count down to zero. Five, four, three, two, one. And then what you're going to realize is this, that when you have nerves, again, I'm going to give you some science. Your body physically, when it's nervous, when palms are sweating, hearts racing, you got the jitters, it cannot distinct itself from excitement and fear. They have the same exact physical response. Proven, proven, proven. Okay. Hands get sweaty, get jittery, get excited, butterflies, nerves. When we're excited about something good and when we're scared about something potentially bad, okay? And so what I need you to do is after you count down five, four, three, two, one, I want you to say, I'm excited. Not, I'm afraid. I'm excited, right? And then I'm going to add one more piece. And this is all me, by the way. This, this is where the, the JT flavor comes into this combination, which is you are going to say, I'm going to make this interview my beep, whatever you want to say. To I'm going to own this interview. I'm going to rock this interview. This interview is mine. I got this interview, right? I'm going to crush this interview, whatever statement you want to put there, okay? And I want you to watch how you physically change. And I want you to say it out loud if you can with attitude, if not in your head. So let's recap how this works and I'm going to tell you a story. 
So you're going to go five, four, three, two, one. I am excited and I am going to rock this interview. Big smile on your face. I want you to feel it. I am excited and I'm going to rock this interview. And I want you to keep saying that every time you feel fear, every time that nerve comes up, you start over again. Five, four, three, two, one. I am excited. I am going to nail this interview. Oh, nerves come again. Five, four, three, two, one. I am excited. I am going to crush this interview. Maybe you're going to give a power pose, right? Maybe you're in your room, you're practicing. If you can't, you're going to do this all in your head. I want you to visualize. Okay, so true story. My daughter is a senior in high school and she is taking her SATs and she wanted very much to get her SAT scores up. But she will tell you, I don't believe this, but she will tell you that she's not good at tests because she's more methodical and she likes to take her time and timed tests don't work in her favor. If there's no timing on the test, this girl's got it. But if there's a time factor, she's psyching herself out. So she's saying, you know what? The problem with these SATs is they're timed. I can't improve my score. Okay. So I sat down with her and I said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to say five, four, three, two, one. I'm excited. I'm going to make this SAT my boop, right? And I had her say, mom, I can't believe you're going to have me say that. I said, oh, yeah, mom's going to have you say it. Do it. So first time she said it, kind of a whisper. And I said, nope, I need bigger. Second time she said it, nope, that's not big enough. And so I kept saying it back to her. And I was striking poses and I was making her laugh. And finally, I said, I'm not going to quit until you give it to me. And she said, five, four, three, two, one. I'm excited. I'm going to make this my beep. I said, beep. I said, beep. But you guys know where I'm going. And we all laughed so hard and made her say it as a family. So literally the morning of the SATs, 6 a.m. She gets up, gets ready to take herself there. Mom gets out of bed. And I said, give it to me one more time. She's cracking up laughing. Fast forward to last week. She raised her SAT scores 100 points. 100 points, my friends. And she said to me, I finished early. Both both of them, the math and the verbal. I finished early. That's when I knew it was on to something. So didn't mean to turn this into that session, but I'm going to give it to you folks. There's my advice. The first piece, counting down, not mine. Amazing person on YouTube gave me that idea. Second piece, the science, again, not mine. Scientists learn that your excitement is no different than you being scared. So let's decide it's not going to be scared. It's going to be excitement. Let's say it. And the third step, all mine, <laughs> you are going to tell me how you are going to own whatever you're tackling. And you're going to do it with gusto. And you're going to visualize yourself saying that and making yourself laugh. And I want you to tell me how it goes, okay? But you keep doing it. You don't quit over and over again. The secret is to what? Work it daily, or in this case, work it multiple times in that day until you're truly feeling it. Okay, so a little pep talk there. Let me know how it goes. But I will tell you, this thing works. I've got a daughter to prove it. So, okay. Question. So Jocelyn says, what are the steps to switching from accounting background to healthcare management role or a creative role? All right. Well, first of all, I've done some videos here on YouTube around the idea of career change. It's a very popular topic. And Jocelyn, what I'm going to tell you is that it requires you to signal. I always say this, you would never be going down the German Autobahn 150 miles an hour and just switch over into the other lane. You would cause a crash. It would not work at all, right? Would not work. You would do a, a signal and you would give them plenty of signaling so they knew you were going to zoom into the other lane. Well, career change is the same thing. I love it when people say, I've decided I'm going to switch careers. I know I'm perfect for this job. Well, that makes one of you. One person knows that you're perfect for the job. You have not signaled to a larger audience that you are, in fact, good for that job, nor have you proven it to them. Okay. So you, first of all, have to decide what area you're going to focus on. You can't pick all three. And then you have to connect the dots. How do you absolutely quantifiably know that it would be okay for you to move in this? Not just because you want to. There's got to be some backstory here around how you feel your skills are transferable, how you even came to this realization. That story, that career story is vital because you're going to have to connect the dots for a lot of strangers. And you're going to have to share that career story and that pivot story with a lot of people to get their buy-in. So what we have you do if you join the Work It Daily program is we have you, first of all, identify what you want to pivot to. Secondly, write out your career story that helps you identify how you've come to the realization that that's where you should be and how you can validate that for others. And then third, we get you out there and you start telling that career story to the right people, which is you create a bucket list of employers 
in this new space and you try to meet as many people as you can that work there and start telling them that story. And the more people you meet in the new area, the more signaling you do, right? The better your career story gets, the feedback they give you, the tweaks, the improvements you make in telling that story so that you're more compelling, that's when eventually you will open doors for yourself. You will suddenly be surrounded by people who have been signaled and understand and know what you're sharing and what you're doing and why you're doing it. And all of a sudden they're going to hear about a job opportunity and go, hmm, I should let her know about that. That actually lines up with that story she told me. That's how it works. Because you've got to have energy and enthusiasm and clarity to change careers. This is, again, why so many people do not change careers. They know what they don't want. Oh, I want to get out of this job that I'm in. But they have no clear sense of direction of where they want to go. And therefore, their messaging is, is non-existent. Fuzzy at best, but non-existent. And nobody hires or buys fuzzy marketing. We buy clear, compelling messages that speak to us. As consumers of brands, we align ourselves with brands that get us excited, brands that can make our lives better or alleviate pain. You are a brand. You are a business of one. And if you are trying to get into a new market, that market doesn't know you. You've got to educate that market in a way that gets them excited about your brand's possibilities for them. And that's on you. And you can do it. We see people do it all the time. You just have to know how to do it. Okay? All right. I hope that works. Let's see. Brayette Garcia. I'm a first generation college student. Congratulations, Brayette. That's awesome. How can I use that as my strength without sounding like I'm making it an excuse? I, well, I don't know where you're getting the idea that sounds like an excuse, Brayette. I, don't, I just, it doesn't sound like an excuse to me at all. I think it's exciting. Deliver it with excitement. I am a first generation college student. I am so excited about that. Here's why the generations before me did not get a college degree. Here's how I got mine. Here's why I can't wait to use it. It's all in the way that you deliver it. Absolutely. I didn't interpret it that way when I read it. It's not a liability. It's a plus. Make it a plus. Deliver it as a plus. <laughs> That's all you need to do. Excellent. Excellent. Um, Stacy is saying, any advice for an on-demand voice interview via montage? I've never done one before. Oh, yeah. So, Stacy, my advice to you, we I know that we did a video. One of my teammates did a video here on YouTube where we talk about prepping for video interviews, but um, you really do need to prep for video interviews. And folks, this is something that's becoming more and more common out there. Companies are using technology like the technology I'm using here today to be with you, to have an interview. So some things that are really important, Stacey. So first of all, backdrop, nothing distracting. I don't need the cat walking along the back here. I don't need to see your bed. I've literally seen that. People have interviewed with their unmade bed behind them. I don't want to see that. Lighting. I don't want it to be dark. So it looks like you're like in the evil cave. Um, great tip is always make sure you have really bright lights. What you guys can't see are two huge lights sitting in front of me, blaring me right now in order to brighten up this whole area, right? You've got to do that. So you got to think about lighting. You've got to think about camera height. This is another thing that we teach you about. So Stacy, if you're sitting there and you put your camera like this so that they, you're looking down in them, that creates a really creepy feeling. And at the same time, if you're way down here looking up, that makes you look really meek. You've got to make sure that your camera's eye height. And last but not least, Stacy, you got to practice looking into the camera. You see what happens when I try to read you guys. I take off, I break eye contact. I don't like to have to do that, but I don't have a choice. You want to make eye contact in the interview. And you may think, well, the interviewer is down here. So I should look down there. Uh-uh. You need to learn to look into a camera. Not an easy thing for people to learn. So my advice, Stacy, is to practice. Practice, practice, practice. Get out your interview questions and start answering them into a camera for a while until it just starts to feel a little normal because that's going to help you feel more normal in the interview. Okay? Good luck with that and definitely watch our video on it. And of course, we've got a lot more on how to do that inside Work It Daily. Yes, one more shameless plug because I don't understand. I'm going to be honest. I do not understand why you are all not members of Work It Daily. It is so affordable. It is so amazing. We have the most incredible professionals inside this platform. It's like everything you ever wanted out of LinkedIn, but it's not giving you. It's that connection. It's that community. It's answers from proven professionals. It's motivating. It's social media that's good for you that you should spend time on every single day. Again, I don't know why the world has not figured Work It Daily out, but they will. And if you're one of our early adopters, you're going to be able to go, oh, yeah. I was with Work It Daily and JT and the crew back when they were, you know, just starting out before there were a million people in there, right? But um, I'm telling you folks, you're missing out. I know some people from the program are in here right now that will vouch for me. I'm not just saying that. It is amazing. Okay. 
Other questions. Let's see. I see a question from, let's see. Let's see. I got rejected two weeks ago from a firm and was told that I was among the top two finalists and nothing was wrong. And now they have the same opening after two weeks. Should I apply? No, don't apply. Absolutely not. Contact the person that recruited you for the first interview and say, I see that you posted the job again. And it looks like, you know, it very similar to the last job. Would it be okay if I applied again? I know that I, I came in second the last time. I still really want to work for you. Would it be okay if I apply again? I want you to get a direct answer from them because they said to you that you were second runner up and there was nothing wrong. So it, you want to ask them, would it be okay if I apply again? I, do, I didn't want to stuff your inbox. I didn't want to just put in another application blindly. I wanted to check and see with you first because again, I'm really excited about the organization and the opportunity to work for you. So I would go directly to them. This is what I mean about having conversational job search. You want to converse with them. You've already conversed with them once before. Don't go back to the application process. Go to the source and ask politely whether or not it would be worth your while to apply again and see what they say. I'll tell you, sometimes people assume that you're probably off working someplace else, or a lot of times they assume you're not going to want to hear from them because they rejected you, you know, or maybe you're going to hear, you know what, we actually don't think you're a fit for the company. And we should have told you that the first time that could happen too. But wouldn't you rather know that as well so that you can move on? Was, yes, of course, which is much better than you applying and never hearing anything and wondering what happened, which is why you go to the source and you ask if it's okay for you to apply, okay? Because one way or another, you're going to get an answer. You're going to get some information that you can do something with. Excellent. Okay. Amy, Amy is asking, any advice for a second round interview that requires a presentation? Yeah. So the one thing I'll tell you about presentations these days is to make them as visual as possible. For those of you, this is becoming more common. Um, companies want to understand your thought process. They want to see um, what you're thinking and how you put that together and how you present that, how you would present that to your peers. That's why they ask you to do these presentations. What I don't advise you to do is create a very text intensive presentation for two reasons. One, it's super boring right? People are staring instead of listening to you and what you're saying, they're reading all the little print on the page and they're, they're all sucked in and you've completely lost your audience. So you don't want to have all this text on there. And two, you don't want to give it all away. You don't want to create this detailed written blueprint that they can then take and go use with their existing staff. So you want to make this as visual as possible, Amy, take your concepts to 30,000 feet and create talking points. So I land on a page, there's a picture that's really, you know, funny or interesting that gets me laughing and a title. And then I talk to that. What did I mean? Why did I put this on the page? Well, this is what it means. And I move to the next one. Or maybe you're going to take them through a four-step methodology. Fine. All I'm going to see is welcome, step one, step two, step three, step four, maybe a key word takeaway or a page of, of five bullet points. But you're going to go with the 30,000 foot view, not a lot of text, use pictures to make your point into a vocal motion and really focus in on them listening to you speaking and what you have to say. That is the secret to a successful presentation for a job search these days, okay? Again, don't give away the farm and don't get them distracted with too much text. It does not work. All right, very good. Very, very good. All right, so, and oh, good, we've got a shout out. We've got Maria, who's part of our program that, um, and she's already got a couple interviews. Yeah, Maria, that's what I'm talking about. See, folks, Maria has got it going on. And this is what happens when you join the Work at Daily Family. <laughs> you start to push yourself in the right direction. And look, I would love to tell you that um, it's rocket science and we've got some sort of secret magic pill. It's not. It's not. Again, I'll go back to that quote from Einstein. He said, I'm not smarter. I just stick with the problem longer. We've stuck with the problem of job search and career development longer than anyone else. And we've created a set of modules and resources that work in a logical format that make you feel successful and accomplished, like you're doing something, like, you're feel, like your, your time and your energy is being well spent. That translates into happy vibes in your head. Those happy vibes translate into confidence. That confidence translates into you taking more risks and getting out there and putting yourself out into the world. And lo and behold, guess what happens? People respond and you get results. That's all it is. That's all Work It Daily is. It is the framework to enable you to work it daily in a productive fashion. That is what we do. 
And I will tell you, we do it better than anyone else. I am not kidding you. I am not kidding you. <laughs> so come check us out. And by the way, as you're seeing, if you're paying attention over here, we are giving you a discount code. Anybody that attends the session today can save $10 off a month on this program, which is enormous. Enormous. It's already, honestly, I'm going to be honest, so cheap for the value. I can say that. It is so inexpensive. It costs you hundreds of dollars to work with a career coach for one one-hour session in person. You'll go leave all hyped up and then you're back to square one. It costs thousands of dollars to have your resume done. And most of the time it's not done right. I'm talking about super inexpensive way for you to work with our team and all these amazing people. So really, 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 really good stuff. And by the way, oh, hey, Miss Nina. And Nina's already gotten three interviews with companies on her bucket list. For those of you that don't know what a bucket list is, this is a big part of what we do. We have you define the companies that you'd like to work for. Instead of you just applying to everything online and never hearing back and feeling terrible about it from these companies that you didn't even like in the first place, what if we flipped this whole job search process around and you decided who you wanted to work for and why? And what if you then carefully crafted your messaging to introduce yourself to them and let them know why they make your bucket list? What do you think? You think they're going to respond a little bit better from a candidate who's saying, I'm a big fan of your company and what it does. Let me tell you why I know what you do as a company is really smart. Yeah. I'm going to talk to that candidate because <laughs> that candidate gets us. This is how we're turning the job search process completely around inside of Work It Daily, making it more fun, making it more engaging. Again, giving you the tools to work it daily successfully, to feel good about your efforts. So thank you, Miss Nina, for sharing that. Really appreciate it. Okay. I always go so fast here. Michael says, uh, JT, new boss. I tried to reform inefficient and inefficient instructor. They decreased the quality. Uh, the let them go approach should I take two months and no progress complicated part. They've been there for four years. Okay. So Michael's bringing a very interesting situation. Michael's been brought in to make changes in the organization. We, this is usually what we're all brought in for when we're put into these kinds of roles. Um, and he's got somebody who's underperforming, but the person has been there for a really long time. Yeah. And so trying to, to have them try it this way, try it that way. And the person's not listening folks. These are very hard conversations to have with somebody. Very, very hard. I know none of us like confrontation. None of us like to have to tell somebody they're not doing a good job. But you are not doing them any favors by not being honest with them. Not doing them any favors. And let me talk about why. So first of all, this person needs to know that they're not meeting the behaviors that are now defined for the organization. Maybe they were meeting the behaviors in the old organization. But the reality is with the change of, of a new leader, there's a change in the expectations and the expectations aren't being met. It's not emotional. It's not, hey, you're a bad person. It's simply that the way you were doing it before worked for the previous manager. The way you're doing it now doesn't. Simple case. So don't need to get emotional. Don't need to, to we were not picking on you. It's simply, here's the deal. When I came in, we had to change the expectations and change how we're doing things. I've been tasked with changes. The best way I know how to make those changes is to change what we do as instructors. I have spent the last couple of months trying to coach you through that. Now I need to be more direct with you. You are not meeting the expectations that I need and you're not doing the things the way that I need them to be done. So let's work together to get you there. Do you want to stay? Because if you do, I want to help you get there. You've been with us four years. And I would love to help you get to that place. But I respect the fact that you came in under a different organization with a different set of expectations. If you aren't feeling like you can get there, and if you don't feel 100% committed to the idea of learning it and doing it our way, then how about we work together to find you your next opportunity? I will commit that to you. I will give you a great recommendation about the work you've done over the last four years. And you can work to find a new opportunity someplace else so that I can put somebody in here that does want to do it this way, because I don't want to disrespect you. You've worked really hard over these last four years. But again, the rules have changed. The requirements have changed. So I need you to either adapt to those changes, which I will 100 support, but I'm going to have to call you out and really get you to that place. Or if you don't want to, and I respect it and I understand it. I think we should work together on you finding your next opportunity so that I can go ahead and put somebody in here who can do that because I am tasked with the job of making this change a reality. And that is the only way I know how to do it. Do you see how that works? Does everybody see how this isn't a blame game? Because if you go into it with that way, what you're saying to that person is I'm not going to discount 
the four years of success you had in this organization under a certain set of rules and expectations. I'm never going to discount that ever, ever. That is yours to own and to keep and to be proud of. However, now we've got this. And I either need you to decide that you're going to spend the next four years achieving those expectations and reaching that so that you can have that next block of success. Or I can accept that you don't feel comfortable with this, that this doesn't feel right to you. Give this person the choice because that's really what they're faced with right now. And when you do it that way, you're not blaming, you're not making them feel bad. You're recognizing them for the success that they had. You're asking them for a new form of success and you're giving them the option to choose. I've done this in the past and it's been amazing. I've had people say, you know what, JT, I've actually really wanted to get out of here for a long time, but you know, I'm, I don't know how to do that. I don't know where to go. I don't, I can't be without a job. Okay. Awesome. Then you do what I need you to do right now. And you and I'll work together and find you a new job. How do you think I became a career coach? This is literally what I did in the corporate world. That's when I knew career coaching was so valuable. And a couple of things would happen. Sometimes We'd find them a new job. We'd stay so close. They'd go off. Awesome. Sometimes they'd start doing it the way I needed them to do. And about a month into it, they'd come back and go, I'm actually in love with this. I won't leave. Awesome. Okay. Don't leave. We're in sync now. Brilliant. Either way. And sometimes they drag their feet on the job search. They drag their feet on the job. And we go, guess what? We're going to give this 90 days. We've got 90 days to work together. For you to find a new job, for me to help you, I'll let you, give you time in your daily schedule. You just need to meet the expectations. And at the end of the 90 days, we go, well, we worked together 90 days on this. It's time for you to go. And now you can let them go knowing that you spent those 90 days being really honest and transparent. Okay, so you're going to want to give them a deadline on that. Does that help? Does everyone see that? I ask you to think about it. If you were in the situation on the receiving end of this, which would be better? Being told, you know what, you're just not doing it the way I'm trying to teach you to do it, which is... All they're going to hear is blah, 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 fail, 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 fail. And boy, they're going to be angry and confused because they just spent four years being successful at this company in their mind. Or let's celebrate your success of four years. Let's recognize the fact we need something different. And I'll let you choose whether or not you want to rise and have your success here. Or do you want to go do it someplace else? Either way, I support you and I will help you. Okay, I'm going to stop there and see if that makes sense to everybody. Does that make sense? Hopefully, yes. Oh, yes, Michael, I remember you. Dream job. See, I love that word. There is such a thing, folks. There is such a thing. When you start dreaming, when you start focusing, and when you know what to do and how to do it on a daily basis, good things do happen. Yeah, it's a great stuff. Love to see that. Yeah, so I see a quick question here from Dee. Dee says, she, um, I got it, just comments. I've got a master's degree in healthcare and I can't find a job. So a couple things I'm going to tell you about master's degrees. Um, and this is the hard advice nobody wants to hear. They're a dime a dozen. And if you've got MS after your name or MBA after your name at the top of your resume and at the top of your LinkedIn profile, you're actually getting yourself tossed from more job search results. No joke, folks. I need you all to understand this. When you put MS or MBA after your name on your resume or after your name on your LinkedIn, what you are saying to recruiters is, I have a master's, I have an MBA, and I expect to use it, and I expect to be paid accordingly. That is the branding message that you're sending. The reality is most recruiters are recruiting for jobs that do not require these. And therefore, when it's blaring and it's the first thing they see right after your name, they put you in the no pile. So you are probably being removed from a lot of opportunities. You need to learn how to actually um, put it in its appropriate place. I'm not suggesting you play it down. I'm suggesting you recognize that you don't want to lead with it. It's not the lead story. It is not the lead story. And you also have to go about your networking, by the way even more differently. One thing that I do, so you guys know, we, we have two different programs. We have a professional level program, which is for all professionals. We have an executive program, strictly for executives who um, are, are doing much more, you know, kind of a complex job search. And let me tell you why. You might be thinking, well, why is there a difference? There's a big difference. Because when you start out in your career and you have no experience, there's a lot of jobs available to you. There's a lot of, of no experience jobs. And then you start to climb. And people make this mistake of thinking job search will get easier. And maybe for a little stretch of time, it does. So that stretch of time where you start to have, you know, two to five years of experience up to about 10 years of experience in the sense that there's, there's 
less jobs, but not so many less, right? And you have a little bit of experience, but you're in the sweet spot of your career in the sense that um, companies think they're getting incredible value because you can get things done, but you're learning a lot. So you're learning a lot, you're growing, they're getting a lot back. Beautiful phase of your career. But that's about the easiest part of job search. After that, as you climb, job search gets harder and harder and harder, and people do not know this. So I've had people come to me in their, their 40s and 50s and go, I don't get it. Job search is so hard right now. It was never hard for me before. Yeah, because you've created so much experience and you know what you want, that there are a lot fewer jobs and a lot of people competing for them. Lots and lots of people. And it gets harder and harder and harder and harder, right up through the executive level. So the higher you climb up that ladder, folks, right? You might think, oh, I stand out but there are a lot less jobs up there and there's a bunch of people competing with you. So you have to know your brand. You have to have all the strategies for marketing and, and connecting, right? That conversational job search gets more and more important because you're going after some big stuff. You're going after jobs that are more specialized, jobs that are usually paying more, jobs that make you feel better, that you enjoy more. When we're going after that, it requires more effort. Now, I say more effort, but it doesn't have to be miserable. You don't have to be miserable in your job search. I'm not saying harder as in, oh, I'm going to be miserable more. On the contrary, if you're growing as a professional, it might be getting more challenging, but you can get smarter at it too. You can know how to navigate this process and play at a higher level. And when you do know how to do that, then it gets really interesting right? So um, be thinking about that. Wherever you are in your career, you're, you're probably past the point right now. It's not feeling easy. It will never feel easy. Never, ever. Job search will never be um, easy. In fact, if you have those people in your life, and I know you do, and you go, GGT, they just seem to fall into everything. You know, he's always got a new job. She just always seems to get promoted, move over to the next hot company. That's not accidental. That's conversational job search. That person has been leveraging a higher level of job search and is reaping the rewards, okay? But you need to know how to do that. So I hope that helps. You can do it. You have your masters. You can do this, but you're going to have to operate this job search at a higher level, okay? I know you can do this. I see it happen all the time. All right. All right, last question of the day. Oh, my goodness. It says... Um, Maria says, would putting a certification designation like CPA next to your name at the top of your resume have the negative effect? No, that's an exception to the rule. A CPA is a certified public accountant. A PhD is a physician, right? A PE is a, a professional engineer. When you have had to take a certification designation for a specific type of skill set, those are normal to put after your name. So again, CPA, PE, and then PhD, those would go after your name. Those would be commonly accepted because you literally would have to have those to do your job. You don't have to have a master's to do certain jobs. You don't have to have an MBA to do certain jobs. That's why that shouldn't be on the end of your name. But those three, CPA, PhD, PE, those are required a lot of times for you to even be considered for the job. That's when that would go after your name. Okay. Job. Awesome. Okay. So wrapping up, if I didn't get to your question, I'm sorry. I just have to, to grab what questions are there. I do, I do the best that I can. If you want all your questions answered, you join Work It Daily. You join either our professional program or our executive program. Get in there, work with our awesome coaches, right? Meet your teammates, meet amazing professionals. Do some conversational job search. Do some easy networking right inside there with smart, talented people like yourself and get some results. That's what it's about. All right. I really hope you decide to join us. I promise you. I mean, every single day somebody goes, I don't know why I waited so long. I get that all the time. JT, I watched your office hours for, you know, two months and I watched all your videos and I finally decided and now I regret it. You know, I didn't do it two months ago. I know. I don't know what else to tell you all other than eventually you're going to try working daily. You're going to fall in love and you're going to understand why so many people are joining us every single day, but in your own time, right? As they say, when the student is ready, the teacher appears, right? So I know you'll all join us soon enough. You will, you'll figure it out. Otherwise, I guess I'll see you next week. Yes. All right, everybody have a great week. We'll see you next week on office hours. Take care, my friends. Bye-bye.